Tonight at 6 p.m. Eastern over on Jaguar Gator 8, a new college football video drops. And now, on with our feature presentation. The man you're looking at right now is former New England Patriots head coach Ron Earhart. He was the coach of the team for three seasons from 1979 to 81. In his first season in charge in 1979, the good news was that the Patriots were a really good team. They had the second best offense in football only five points behind the eventual champion Pittsburgh Steelers for the top total in the NFL. And at plus 85, they had the third highest point differential in all of football, only behind the San Diego Chargers and the Pittsburgh Steelers. The bad news was that at 9-7, they missed the playoffs by one game. Incredibly unlucky. In his second season in charge in 1980, the good news was that the Patriots were a really good team. They had the best offense in the AFC, and once again, had the second best offense in the NFL, only 13 points behind the Dallas Cowboys for the top total in the league. Their point differential of plus 116 was the best in the AFC and the fourth best total in football. The bad news was that at 10-6, once again, they missed the playoffs by one game. Incredibly unlucky, and you can learn more about that by clicking the card in the upper right corner. In his third season in charge in 1981, the good news was that this time, the Patriots did not miss the playoffs by one game. They were not barely on the outside looking in, wondering what could have been and contemplating just how unlucky they were. And that's because the bad news is that in 1981, they absolutely stunk. The Pats went just 2-14 that season, which was at the time, the worst record in franchise history. And you can make the argument that excluding 1990, when they were 1-15 and when a whole bunch of controversial things happened off the field that I'm not going to get into, the 1981 season was the worst in franchise history. It was that bad. And while the season did not get off to a great start by any means, as they were 1-4 through the first five weeks of the year, the game where it all fell apart was this one right here, in Week 6 against the New York Jets. And it fell apart on one of the dumbest plays in the history of the Patriots, and on one of the dumbest plays considering the circumstances that I have ever seen. Imagine calling a play, that has a 0% chance at working, that you explicitly decided not to call because of that exact reason throughout the game. That's what happened here. Because the Pats lined up in a formation that was so bad and was never going to work that it halted their momentum and ended any chance they had at winning the game and saving their season. And this is the story behind the dumbest formation in the over 60 year history of the New England Patriots. Before I talk about the play and the formation in question, we need some context to understand how the game was going, because it will truly help us to understand what made this play all the more stupid. It's October 11th, 1981, and we have an AFC East rivalry game on our hands down at Chase Stadium between the New England Patriots and the New York Jets. The stakes for this game for both of these teams are absolutely massive, as both the Patriots and Jets enter this one with just one win under their belt through the first five games. Only five teams in each conference make the playoffs, and there were seven teams in the AFC with at least three wins, including the Miami Dolphins, who are leading the AFC East with a 4-0-1 record, and had the number one seed in the AFC as things stood. In other words, both of these teams were off to a horrible start. They were probably too far back in the division, and the AFC was not going to be a forgiving conference by any means. Lose this game, and have just one win in your first six games, and your season, for all intents and purposes, is over. This was an early survival game, where whoever lost this game would have no shot whatsoever at making the postseason. And early on, it was the hometown Jets who would be on the front foot and would get things going, when on the second drive of the game, Richard Todd threw a 17-yard pass to Jerome Barkham to give the Jets an early 7-0 lead. As a side note, to learn more about Barkham and his career in the NFL, click the card in the upper right corner following a two-yard touchdown run by Mossy Tatupu of the Patriots to open up the second quarter and tie the game up, Richard Todd threw two more touchdown passes before the halftime break, hitting Jerome Barkham from five yards out for his second touchdown catch of the game and hitting Wesley Walker from 29 yards out. Following a nine-yard touchdown run by Tony Collins at the end of the half, the Jets were ahead 21-14 when the halftime whistle sounded. But the Jets would regain their two-possession lead when, in the third quarter, Daryl Ray intercepted a pass thrown by Matt Cavanaugh. I couldn't tell you who this pass was intended for, because there was no one anywhere near the ball, and this will be the easiest pick of Ray's career. 
but he took it 43 yards to the house to give the Jets a 28-14 lead. That would be the last pass that Kavanaugh threw all day, as he was abysmal, going 8 for 20 with 110 yards, no touchdowns, two interceptions, four sacks that lost 33 yards, which means he had just 77 net passing yards on this day, and a passer rating of 18.7, which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. The Pats decided to put the veteran Steve Grogan in there to try and right the ship. This was Grogan's chance at redemption, as he hadn't played since week two against the Philadelphia Eagles, when he started in a 13-3 loss and threw no touchdowns and three interceptions. And to Grogan's credit, he was able to help cut the deficit to 28-24, and with two and a half minutes left in the contest, the Pats had a shot at winning the game if they could mount a drive down the field. It would take a lot. They would need to go 88 yards, but if they were going to win this game and save their season, then this is what had to be done. There was no other way. Things started off all right for the Pats, as a swing pass to Don Calhoun, following a pass to Tony Collins over the middle, gives them some breathing room and gives them a first down. Good start to the drive. Grogan was getting all of the running backs involved, as the Pats picked up their second first down of the drive after Grogan hit running back Andy Johnson for a gain of 10. But with things looking dire shortly after, and the Pats facing 4th and 13, with the game on the line, Grogan delivered once again, and hit the then three-time Pro Bowl wideout Stanley Morgan over the middle for a first down, to get into Jets territory. Just like that, Jets fans were beginning to sweat. With one minute left, Grogan was getting his offense down the field and in striking distance to find the end zone and pull off this great comeback. Another completion to Andy Johnson to get them to the 35-yard line. Then, another completion to Andy Johnson on a beautiful back shoulder play to get them into the red zone. And then, a throw to Harold Jackson to get them inside the five-yard line and give them a first down. Just five yards sat between them and a stunning victory. Considering how far back they were at one point, and considering how in control the Jets looked, this would have been incredible. They already got 83 yards of the 88 necessary. Just don't mess up or do anything stupid, and you've got this. Instead, the Pats lined up in one of the dumbest formations I've ever seen, and it torpedoed their chances at winning. And even though it might not necessarily look dumb from the onset, when you realize the circumstances that went into calling this play, oh boy, it is a nightmare. Right now, I'm replaying all of the big plays that the Pats had on this drive so far. There's a reason I'm showing the same clips twice even though I hate doing that. And that's because you might notice something similar about all of these plays. Do you see what it is? On every single one of these plays, the Patriots were lining up under center. Steve Grogan was lined up directly underneath his center, Pete Brock. He was not in the shotgun formation. Now at first glance, you might think that's kind of weird. The Pats weren't going to be running the ball on any of these plays. The clock would have run down, they wouldn't have been able to get out of bounds in all likelihood, you're not picking up chunk yards like you would on a pass, and it was just way too risky all things considered. So why were they under center? Doesn't that just seem pointless? If you line up in shotgun, you buy your quarterback more time. You don't have the quarterback waste time dropping back, and you can allow him to go through his reads a bit quicker since you eliminated the drop back part. Well, there was an incredibly valid reason for why the Pats were under center for all these plays. In fact, on this drive up until this point, the Pats had called 12 plays, and on all 12 of them, they had Steve Grogan lined up under center. And the reason for that was because they tried going shotgun earlier in the game, and they couldn't hear a thing. You see, Chase Stadium was loud on this day, and I mean really loud. If you don't believe me, here's just a brief snippet of what the crowd sounded like during this drive. Keep in mind, this was before a play. This wasn't the crowd reacting to a play that just happened. This was during a moment in the game where nothing was happening. This was just the crowd getting pumped up and letting their energy out. Take a listen. crowd was into this game, 
as there were 55,093 people here, with just about all of them rooting for the Jets by the looks and the sounds of it. Not only was this their largest crowd of the season at that point, but it was their largest crowd in two years, when they played the Oakland Raiders on October 21st, 1979, and drew 55,802 people. And considering how close this game was, and how beautiful the weather was, as it was a perfect autumn day on Long Island at 52 degrees and sunny, no one was leaving this game early. One of the downsides of going into the shotgun formation is that in games like this, where the fan base is really loud, it can lead to massive communication issues, where guys aren't able to hear each other. If your quarterback is under center, and therefore is closer to his offensive lineman, communication is much easier. If your quarterback is like Eric Harmon, in that he's all by himself, and he's alone back there with no offensive lineman within five yards of him, it's a lot tougher to communicate, make audibles and adjustments, hear things, and get the snap off cleanly. So the Patriots made the conscious and incredibly smart decision on the drive to completely run plays from under center. Grogan said on the final drive, where the first 12 plays were all run from under center, even though they were all passing situations, we'd stopped using the shotgun because the guys couldn't hear the signals. Makes complete sense. Play to your strengths, and if the option is to call a play that people can hear, or call a play that people cannot hear, you pick the first one every day of the week. But on unlucky play number 13, guess what head coach Ron Earhart decided to have the Patriots do? Remember everything that got us here? Remember everything that got us to this point where we were able to drive nearly the length of the field and have a shot at winning this one? Let's scrap that. Remember how we only call plays under center because that was the only way our guys could communicate with each other? Screw communication! Who needs it? We're switching it up and lining up in the shotgun. Who cares that this is where the fans are literally out there loudest? And who cares that because of the configuration of the stadium, that this is the closest you've been to the fans all drive, making the noise that much worse? Let's run a play out of the shotgun. What can possibly go wrong? I'll give you five seconds to guess what happens. Five, four, three, two... For the snap by the offense. Did you expect anything else? Did you really expect anything else? You want to know why not one, but two players moved well before the snap and thought that Grogan said hike? You want to know why running back Andy Johnson and tight end Don Hasselbeck started running? Because they couldn't hear anything! You abandoned the shotgun because no one could hear anything! And then, for some inexplicable reason, you decide to bring it back, immediately leading to a false start penalty solely because no one could hear anything. How stupid can you be? That's like if I'm an elementary school teacher and I notice two kids who constantly talk to each other in class and are disruptive. So I separate them to opposite ends of the room. Class is now no longer disruptive and everything is flowing swimmingly. Then for some stupid reason, I decide to let them sit next to each other again. And not even 10 seconds later, they're causing a disruption and are back to their old ways. Gee, what did you think was going to happen? The Pats had to back up after that, and what do you know? Grogan throws an interception into the arms of Johnny Lynn, ending the drive, ending the comeback chances, and for all intents and purposes, with the Pats now sitting at 1-5, ending the season. The Jets won by a final score of 28-24, because right as the Patriots were driving, with all the momentum in the world on their side, they decided to do something asinine that was never going to work. Head coach Ron Earhart said that he called the shotgun play because he wanted to get a little more time to throw the ball, but completely forgot that getting more time to throw the ball is completely meaningless if no one knows what time to go off of the snap. Because if there's any play and any moment in NFL history that showcases the idea of if it ain't broke, don't fix it, it's this 1981 game between the Patriots and the Jets. Because if you abandon something for the sole purpose of it not working, the new thing you're trying is working, and you decide to go back to that old thing, don't be surprised when it fails. And don't be surprised when your poor coaching costs you your job at the end of the season. Because especially on this final drive, the Pat should have taken a shotgun to the part in the playbook that had any shotgun formations. Instead, they did not. And what we got was the dumbest offensive formation in Patriots history.
Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com. And be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, and subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot. And be sure to check out Twitch every Wednesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at Jaguar9. To see college football videos, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.